Good afternoon and welcome to You and Your Business with me, Alec Drew, on 103.2 Dublin City FM. Each week, I invite an expert from the world of business to share their knowledge, insights and tips to help you with your business challenges. If there's a topic you would like covered, or if you feel you can make a contribution, please email me at yourbusiness at dublincityfm.ie. And perhaps we'll be having a chat here one day soon. And my guest today is a studio director of Graco Studios. He has more than 20 years of experience in event management. And on top of that, he's more than eight years experience in online hybrid events. I'm delighted to welcome Graeme Mulcahy to the You and Your Business Studio. Hiya, Graeme. How are you doing, Alec? Thanks very much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's, it's fun to be on and talk about great things. Great things. Well, you've probably more experience online than I have over all the years. But anyway, we're going to find out a bit more about this. I suppose I have to take you back to your sort of last year in school. Were you this sort of academic? Were you the person who wanted to travel or did you just want the money? Show me the money. Yeah, I think when I look back at, at my life, I wasn't the most academic of, of your kids. Um, did whatever I could to try and avoid doing tests and exams and whatever. I was more co consumed with the whole idea of making money. And um, and how I was going to do that. But the question leaving my last year in school was, how was that going to happen? Um, and of course, then, of course, you're listening to all your teachers. You're listening to various different people saying, you need to go to college. You need to go <laughs> get an education, go to university or whatever. So I just sat there and I went, hmm, I'm not the most academically minded. Um, really don't enjoy that kind of environment, but I enjoy the buzz of being out around people. So I said to myself, well, okay, people are saying I need to go do something that involves maybe marketing, advertising, and have a look at all that type of stuff. So I decided, okay, did my leaving cert, went to um, not a big college, an LSB, which is there based sure. beside the uh, Westbury Hotel to do sales, a sales and marketing course. Right. And, uh, you must have been brilliant at that. How long did you last at that? Oh, I loved it so much. I lasted six months. <laughs> six That's months great. was my time in college. So, um, yeah, um, this did not sit well with me. This sitting in a room cooped up, uh, being f all this information being forced on me. So I said, you know what? I think the university of life might suit me a little bit better. And I think, I, and plus I was feeling it in my pocket because up to then in school, I was quite fortunate in that I um, got to work some really cool jobs and make some money. And I would probably had more money than most kids would have had at that stage in life. So by going to college, took away the opportunity for me to work. And I felt in my pocket. So that said to me, right, why am I in college doing something I'm really not enjoying when I could be out doing something that gives me money to be able to do things that I do enjoy? So yeah. I said, enough, enough. Um, I don't think I told my parents for about 12 months afterwards that they thought I was still going to college. But um, yeah, so I ended up leaving college and then decided to put my CV together and uh, chanced my arm. And there was a new gadget uh, gizmo gift shop opening on South End with cool stuff. Now, I'm not talking about, it was like remote control cars, different oh. types of radio. It was just really something that kind of grabbed my interest. And they were looking for a store manager. And I put myself in for it, not thinking I would get it because I was a young book or whatever, 18, 19. Sure. And, um, but I did. Yeah. I got the gig and spent a year there making, selling toys and having the fun, meeting people, talking to people um, and selling my wares uh, to people. <laughs> and on a side note, seeing a bank robbery, a post office robbery in my life <laughs> on where on South Ann Street happened, which, I, you know, these are the things in life you see. All I saw was three guys, with one with a gun with a balaclava running into the <laughs> post office and then running by again with a bag. You know, it was kind of those mad times. You yeah, know? well, at least uh, you, you were <laughs> spared that in the yeah. toy shop, you know, where your, your inner child was being expressed more. Anyway, yes. but these are lives. So anyway, you spent a year there, but... Um, um, you were going to have a, a sort of influence from your father. He was going to take you under his wing for a while. Yeah, so at the time, my father was very involved in tourism. Um, he had a couple of companies, but at this stage, he had an incoming tour operator company, which he was running, which he was dealing with foreigners from all over the States, all over Europe, coming to Ireland and organizing all their accommodation, their transport, their, their just their holiday, basically. Sure. Um, 
So they, so again, I think my, my, I got kind of tired of the shop because it wasn't challenging me enough. And I think I thought it was time for me to move on. Where was I going to move on? But I moved on to my father. So he took me under his wing for a couple of years and taught me the, the world of incoming tour operating where I got to meet some very interesting people. And one of the big markets we got involved in back then was shooting with Italians. So the Italians used to come in and shoot pigeon down yeah. around Tipperary, which was huge because all the farmers loved it because they, they told the pigeons as a pest. Yeah, so it's, in, it's Columbachi was the, uh, so I used to collect gun certs, go into Dublin airport, see all these elaborate guns, show customs that these guns were coming in for the reason, blah, 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 and then bring the Italians down to Tipperary. And the actual reason, some of these guns were made out of gold. They were phenomenal things. But like they just saw, they liked the sound of the gun. It wasn't about shooting the pigeon or whatever. <laughs> it was bang, 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 bang. They loved the sound of the gun, the Italians did. But they brought the pigeon home and ate it. So we were exporting the pigeons or whatever. So... Yeah, so I started working with Dad for that. Oh, right. You know? yeah, but that wasn't the only place, and um, there was going to be some rhythm came into your life then. Yes. So my brother, who would have had been given the fortune of having good rhythm in, in his life, um, decided to me, it was 1994, and I said, you know what, there's this mad new craze has come to Ireland. It might be an opportunity to get out and have some fun, meet new people, and maybe meet some women. So, um, which, hey, we're all up for that. So we ended up going down to a place called Break for the Border, if anyone knows it, back in the day. I do. And right on the very first night stood in front of me was Colin Farrell. Yeah. And we were doing the whole art of line dancing. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Okay. It's, it's okay. Colin Farrell's there. So, yeah, he was teaching away. And on the very first night I did it, I won a shirt, a Wrangler shirt, and I said, why do I that? Because you shook your ass very well and you did a great gig <laughs> dancing. And so on. Wow, I just I laughed because I never thought I had rhythm, but I was able to do this. And that's what I thought line dancing was amazing is because it gave you the opportunity to be yourself. You didn't have to do anything for anybody else and you just did it yourself. And then you did it with other people around you and you had a laugh. So, yes. yeah, so we did, we did that for about six, seven weeks. And, as, and it was kind of a workout as well because it was kind of high octane. Place was sure, yeah. rammed and um, got to know Colin Farrell a little bit as well. So um, who's, who was to know what he was to go, to go on and achieve in the future? But he, at that stage, he was a line dancer. And it's funny, I was on the internet the other day and I saw a picture of him back in that day. And I was looking around, am I in that picture? But no, anyway. <laughs> Yeah. So okay. So, so we at that say. time, myself, my brother, we were living out in Mead, out in Dunshockland, and there was a place called the County Club. Uh, people might be familiar with it as well. They brought another troupe to it, and we just said, "Well, it's only literally five minute walk from our house. Right. We don't have to go into the city, but we'll go around and we'll check this out and whatever." So myself and my brother, we were there, and. Because we had had some experience and had a few weeks under our belt, we knew a few dancers. We thought we were cocky little guys who said, yeah, we got this. We'll go in and show our stuff and have the crack and whatever. And there was lots of people who hadn't a clue what they were doing. And then by the end of the first night, um, the, the tour manager of this company came over to us and said, hey, guys, do you fancy joining the troupe and going around Ireland teaching <laughs> line dancing? <laughs> and do. Uh, as you do, it just happens to everybody, as you know. And uh, myself and my brother looked and said, hey, why not? This is an opportunity that would, doesn't come along very often and whatever. So we ended up joining the troupe um, and becoming dancers in this line dancing troupe, going around Ireland, teaching people how to do line dancing and various things like that. So Dan, can I hold you there for one yeah. second? And if you're just joining us now, you're listening to you on your business with me, Alec Drew, on 103.2 Dublin City FM. Uh, where my studio guest today is Graeme Mulcahy. All right, Graeme, you're going to be touring Ireland line dancing. Tell us more. So from that, um, kind of, I went up the ranks in the company in relation to, you start off as a dancer, you're in the audience and people can, you can watch you and follow you. But I had a bit of a flair about myself and I had a, had grandeur, ideas of grandeur made me, but um, said to me, do you know what? I can put a microphone on here. I'll teach or whatever. And they were expanding. They were looking for more venues. So obviously they needed more people to be able to teach. So I went from just being a dancer to a dance instructor and really, really enjoyed that. Right. Um, and things were blowing up and whatever. And th the challenges were getting more and more exciting. And, and 
tough on us. Yeah. And of course, like anybody in business and whatever, when you've got a job, whatever, you go looking for a raise because you feel you're worth it. You've moved up the ranks. You've, you deserve extra money for what you're doing and you're bringing to the company. So I did. I asked for a raise. They said no. Um, <laughs> I asked the second time. They said no. So I just looked at my brother and I said, we can do this. So what we very simply did is we left that company and we went and created our own company. And uh, so in that, to have a company, you needed dancers, you needed a dance instructor, and you needed DJs to play the music of the country music and whatever. So we did. We took some of the dancers with us from the other company yeah. um, who were instructors, and we also took the American instructors with us as well. Um, we offered them better money, and they were quite happy with that. Um, <laughs> So from there, we created a new company. We went around teaching. So I then, from there, became the DJ. All right. And over that time of playing country music, I was kind of going, same old music every, every week. Even though people are loving learning the dance, whatever, I said to myself, music's music. Music's got a beat. So I decided, hey, I'll start playing some pop music, and I'll start playing some dance music of the time okay. and to these dances. And they just absolutely worked an absolute dream so people love the whole idea of the the mixture of music which right. was great they loved the dance music the pop music the country music the whole round experience and also we were the only t uh company at the time was teaching line dancing couple line dancing so you actually got to dance with various different women or guys on the night and it was something different we offered something different right so then with that kind of not that it brought celebrityness or anything like that it kind of brought you out into the scene where you were out drinking or out having parties and out having fun because you're you had the money to have fun so we were in annabelle's we were going to lily's we were going to all the big huge spots we were going to the pod um where all the beautiful people were to be seen or whatever not that i'm saying i'm one of those people but no no but you you had a mini celebrity status because you were in the entertainment industry yeah yeah because people would recognize me from this because not only would we be doing teaching or whatever we'd be brought in by corporates and various different companies to do a routine for them so right. kind of got known for that so from there um in, as people might not know who are listening to this, there was a street called Leeson Street in Dublin, which was full of nightclubs, which only really came to life at about two o'clock in the morning after all the other nightclubs. Now, they didn't really have licensing. The guards, you shut them down an awful lot, but it was a bit of fun. Um, you were extorted for the amount of money you would pay for a bottle of wine. You'd see in Tesco's 10 euros for a bottle of wine. You'd probably end up paying 40 or 50 euros for this. But you were drunk. You were fun. You had girls. You didn't care. You paid the money and you had the champagne and whatever. But because I was constantly going there and having the fun, I was a night owl or whatever. I got to know a guy called Brian, who was the head doorman of Book Ways. And I overheard a conversation he was having with some of some gentlemen or whatever at the time saying, okay, our DJ is going for a two-week holiday. We need a DJ. So because I had known, bro, I stepped up and said, hey, Brian, I'm a DJ. Lying, of course. Well, well, it was a white lie. Yeah, no, no, no. You might have been stretching it a bit, but it was fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was fine. So, and I said to him, listen, I'll do the two weeks for you. I'll cover and have a bit of crack and whatever. So I ended up going into Book Ladies as their DJ for two weeks uh because i had been playing the dance music and the pop music with the country music gave me some knowledge of what was going on around so i wasn't going in completely blind sure. and i had all the cds myself as well because i had been using them at the various gigs so and the two weeks ended they turned around and said graham do you fancy doing a stint here we'll give you this saturday night which i went wow i must have done something right because saturday sure. night is the prime night of the week and i ended up staying there for a year doing djing wow. on a saturday night in book Whaley's. And I'm not going to talk about some of the stories I experienced. While no, we don't to talk about some of the stories. But I, how I say, got I, I got very acquainted with um, champagne and really <laughs> good champagne because guys would walk in, order the bottle of champagne right in front. Because if you knew Book Waities, the DJ box was in the bar. They'd put the bottle of champagne up there. They'd pour the two glasses, just trying to entertain the girls. And just as they take it, the guards would walk in. So I'd grab up, up and grab the bottle of Cristal or the bottle of Bollinger or the bottle and put it down on the floor. And then close, I would be then consuming this. So I got a taste for champagne. <laughs> but however, so that was that was that career. And after that, I kind of I got a feel and a love for DJing. And I said, then there's a new bar opening up in Rap Mines called uh, Swamp Critters. Right. And it was owned by the Dwyer Group at the time. 
And um, I chance, again, as there's probably, you're running through this whole interview, you're nosing. I have an awful thing of chancing my arm of saying I can yeah, do listen, we all do it. We're all in business. We're entrepreneurs. You have to. Yeah. Stretch so the to business. I yeah. said to him, listen, I'll supply you with DJs for Swamp Critters every night of the week. Whenever you want them, I'll do the DJing. No problem. I'm won the contract. Right. Um, so for went from being in in um, Leeson Street to working in Rap Mines and Swamp Critters four and five nights a week. Loving it. Getting to know people and whatever. And then there was another venue down the road, which some of you might know is How the Moon on Main yes. Street. No, well, which was owned by the Dwyers as well. Yeah, and, and a situation arose where there was a problem with the sound equipment. And uh, of course, being the DJ sound equipment, they came over to me and said, Graham, there's a guy down there, not sure what's going on. Can you go down and have a look? Sure. Not knowing what I was doing, I said, I'll oblige because these guys are Give him a keep in good form with him, whatever. So I go down and have a look, and I met. So I went down, had a look at the equipment, and I met a gentleman down there by the name of Ian. And between the two of us, we got it going. So because we got claps on the back then, because uh, we got the systems going, and they were well happy and very similar things. So I built a relationship with Ian. And then what very happened is himself and his business partner decided to start a new company called Star DJs. And Ian then asked me, "Would I like to join?" and become one of the founding members of one of the DJs that started the company. And there was, it ended up being eight of us. Okay. Um, Garvin and Ian owned the company. And then there were six of us that were the DJs. And we then started doing various different gigs around the country for the likes of uh, Guinnesses, Budweiser, Carlsberg. Promotions Tierra, and things like that, yeah. Various beer promotions, anything that needed. So I got a very big re reputation for, my, for being very vocal and being very <laughs> MC and could have a bit of fun with. I can um, understand that, yeah. Go on. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings us up to 1998 um, in my story. And then very simply then, where I was also on a on a radio station called Pulse FM at the time. I was doing the night shift, and I was also on a program called The Doghouse, which Garvin, who was star DJ, ran, and we had the crack on that. And Pulse at that time, if you were around, them, was quite a big pirate radio station. It was quite a big, huge following. Mark McKay from Maniac 2000 was one of the big DJs then, um, and who is now with 2FM, various different sure. And with all that big song, Maniac 2000, he wrote and sang and has been an anthem for Ireland like for years. So I got to know him there. So it was kind of one of those places where you got to know a lot of the big DJs that are now DJs in the world of radio and all that now. Yeah, they're, so, they're, they're, they're more legal now. And if you just give yeah. me a minute, if you're just joining us now, you're listening to you in your business with me, Alec Drew, 103.2 Dublin City FM, where my guest today is Graham Mulcahy. So, okay, from the world of pirate radio stations and DJs, to, my goodness. Um, but you were going to move on because um, you, you found something else that you loved, um, flying. Yeah, so in 1998, a group of us went to Vegas and uh, of star DJs, the core guys, and whatever. We went to Vegas because there was a, an international DJ conference on. Uh, and uh, we decided we'd all go over for the crack and whatever. And that's where we got to play to over 6,000 of our peers DJing ourselves. Here's wow. six Irish lads on stage, giving it loads to 6,000. But myself and Ian decided we'd, we'd charter a helicopter and go into the Grand Canyon and found my love for flying. Wow. I just was blown away by this. And I said, this is something I want to do. I really, really want to do. So came back from Vegas. Um, then I was with a girl at stage. So I did, I'll get to the flying part in a second, but just to give context to this is that I then broke up with a girl, went to Spain, stood on a beach going, what am I going to do next? Went, found a bar, which a friend of mine had told me about and got to know a guy there. And a long story short, he offered me a DJ gig. So I moved to Spain, ran away from this girl. Of course, we all run away from something in our lives. So I ran away to Spain <laughs> for the summer, packed up my car, drove down with my brother, had the best road trip down there ever, spent six months in Spain, having the time of my life. So then came back and sort of DJed a little bit, whatever, but then the flying came back up and I went in 2000, moving along then we went, I moved to Florida for a couple of weeks to learn how to fly um, Robinson 22s and a uh, place out of Lantana, there was the airport in Lantana and did things like flying, the, which is movie quality type of stuff, flying the beaches of Miami with no doors yeah. on the helicopter, flying around. 
And then one of the, one of the things you've got to do as a helicopter pilot is called an auto rotation, right? And what that very simply is, you need to fly up to about 2,000 feet, turn off the whole helicopter and take control of it as it's falling out of the sky and then to control it as it's just before you crash. Right, so it's called an auto rotation. And my instructor had this high, great idea that we do it over the Everglades where all the alligators were. So they said, well, if you're gonna go, you might as well be eaten. So this is where I learned about auto rotations and flying helicopters and whatever. Really, really fell in love with this. Came home after doing that and whatever. And I sat down with my dad and said, dad, really wanna learn how to fly helicopters uh, more, not as a per private thing, but as a commercial thing. Sure. And at, as at that time, we were going through the Celtic Tiger in Ireland. Um, a lot of uh, the builders and all that, there was an average of about 17 to 19 helicopters being bought in Ireland a week. Yes, so I remember the days. I remember the days. <laughs> yeah. And it was a case of, oh, yeah, there's this great idea. Oh, I'll buy a helicopter. I'll fly it myself. I'll be able to fly it all around. But that soon dwindled out and they were looking for pilots. So I thought, you know what? I love flying. Want to learn how to fly. And why not do it as a business? And so basically sat down, decided to go and learn to become a commercial pilot, find out the ins and the outs, found out that the different laws of aviation and all that between America and Ireland. So I had to start to scratch again in Ireland. And so that was, so just before about to pull the plug, what happens is the crash came in Ireland. So that put an end to that. And in that time of also playing with, playing with helicopters and whatever. I was still doing DJing. I was doing events. I was creating a bit of a business in the background and whatever. And it was starting to build as well. But then, of course, with the crash, that all went out the door. There was going to be, yeah, there was going to be some seismic changes. And I suppose I want to spend the last five minutes of this show just getting people, we'll just move it on quickly to what yeah. you're more doing now because you've brought a huge amount of experience and knowledge into the sector you're in. And I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that because I oh, can talk to you all day about the rest I've, of it. There's a book in everyone, they say. I like no, of course. I'm only realizing that after I'm talking about you, I could go on and on and on. But yeah. yes. So uh, moving then to 2016 really quickly to what I'm doing now, which where I have a studio in Finglas, a green screen studio, but my main business is online hybrid broadcasting for various companies doing town halls, shareholder meetings, AGMs, and then if it's a concert or they want that to be broadcasted on their social media channels or through Zoom or through Teams or various different things like that. Um, so back in 2016, my brother and myself, we were doing entertainment, we were working for our father, so we were multitasking, whatever, sure. and I saw an opportunity in streaming. We started our streaming business, and within three weeks, don't ask me how we pulled this off, we were in RTE doing the uh, Late Late Toy Show's first ever online stream in 2016. Oh, with wow. Azure and Ryan Therby. So within three weeks of starting. So was, there's a kind of a, a, a running th thing in my life is that I chance my everything and things just happen. What I'm a great believer in is unless you put yourself out there, nothing will happen. So you got to chance it. Fake it till you make it is kind of something they say. But yeah. um, I did a lot of faking. Uh, have I made it yet? Not saying it, but trying. <laughs> well, um, you're still trying though. That's it. Yeah, so we went on from doing then the Late Late Toy Show's hybrid uh, Facebook live event before the Late Late Toy, which is the biggest show of, the, of, of broadcasting sure. of the year. We did that for two years. We then got involved with um, News Talk on their events and showing them how to do and doing stuff for them and moving on then. And since then, we've just been going from strength to strength uh, in relation from doing town halls for various different companies for going around, sh doing the online hybrid event. And then, of course, COVID came. Yes. You know, where everything just completely and utterly changed. And the whole world stopped, everything went online. So this was a perfect opportunity for us in our business. At this time, we didn't have a studio and um, we were just basing ourselves out of a lockup, um, which was fine. Yeah, You know what I mean? All the equipment was there and whatever, and that was fine. But an opportunity arose where my partner saw um, an advertisement uh, on Daft for a studio space for storing equipment because we wanted to change where we want. And it said, this pop of studios over the door. And very simply, I said, you need to go and check that out. Right. Have a look at it. Uh, so this was in 2020. Had a look at this place. And we were the second person who was going to take this. And it was a perfect studio. It was a soundstage, had green screen, it had the nest, it had a second studio for podcasting, an audiobook recording. It had, it has a boardroom, it has a kitchen, it has, it had all the facilities you needed to run a proper studio. 
Um, now, we ha have, over the last two years, myself and my brother, we've spent our time, my brother's name is Colin, by the way, uh, we spent the last two years doing it up, modernizing it. I think we've put in about a kilometer of wiring, uh, yeah. rewired it, new lighting, new everything like that. So we've now just come, found a base. And the two main aspects of our business right now is the online hybrid uh, broadcasting companies bring us in to do this because it's it's completely changed. People, it's a lot more easier for companies. It's a lot more cost effective for companies to do a broadcast to a, to maybe Zoom, um, to um, a social media channel, whatever, than hiring of the hotels, which was the past way of doing things and putting all of them up and feeding them all and whatever. And also it made it more um, easier for the, the person attending various different things because they didn't have to travel. They could just get up out of bed and wear their pajamas and still just put on a nice shirt and what's what's below, you know? Um, and since then, now we've had various companies then doing productions for RTE, for, nice. for um, Virgin Media, um, and then making their corporate videos. So we're a one-stop shop here in the studio in the sense of you can come here and dry hire the studio, do what you want, or you can hire us as a production team. So we do both. Or if you happen to arrive with your production team and you forgot something, you, there's equipment here you can rent. So, um, and yeah, then so we've it, it, You know, it encompasses everything that people need today. And, and yeah. obviously it's geared for a modern audience and also a, a modern business and what they need. Yes, very, very, very much so. And that's, it, it, I think people have the idea now that, hybrid events are going to go. They're going to get even bigger and bigger. And where I'm getting this information very simply is Zoom is changing like you would never believe. Zoom right. is about to have a massive update. Um, right. Because when Zoom was a company that was around when the, the pandemic started, the quality had to drop. I don't know if people understand different things being quality, 360, 720, <laughs> HD, 4K. It's to do with the quality of the picture and the sound and all that. And because of Zoom became so popular and people just so many people were using it, they had to downgrade the quality of the picture down to 360. And then all, of course, that all the things started going, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Am I on? <laughs> you unmute yourself. You unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Hold on a second. Let me bring this person in. Oh, I can't bring him in now. One second. All, all this stuff started. So well, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because you have 20 seconds to tell people where they can find out more about you, Graham, as we run. Where are, you can find us on our website on www.gracostudios.com. And you can find us all about us there. That's fantastic. Well, a special thanks to our guest today for some great knowledge there. Uh, Graeme Mulcahy, thanks also to Sam on Sound. Uh, the podcast of today's show will be available on dublincityfm.ie from tomorrow. Thank you for your company. And please remember to join me, Alec Drew, again next week at the same time, one o'clock, right here on 103.2 Dublin City FM for another edition of You and Your Business. Thanks, Alex, for having me.